got a call from a woman, a member of my show, a wonderful person, who said she wanted to speak to me about something that had happened at our services that made her want to leave the room. Now, as many rabbis in the room can probably identify with, my immediate assumption, this was something that I had done. But the truth is her complaint had nothing to do with me per se. Her complaint was much more basic. Her complaint was about something that we had read in the Torah. So we sat down in the library and she explained to me that every spring, as we approach the end of the book of Aikra, the book of Leviticus, we go through a part of the Torah's code of the Kohanim, of the priests, of the Bali Mumim, of those who have physical deformities. And the Torah lists out how these priests, descendants of Aaron Cohen, if they have all kinds of different kinds of physical disfigurements, are disqualified from serving the temple. And she says to me, Rabbi, every year, I sit in a shul and listen to this, and listen to how God discriminates against the disabled. And it makes me want to get up and leave. And I had nothing to say to her. For the next year, from time to time, this question would reverberate in my mind as I tried to struggle with a solution. I'd like to share with you a response I'm written some 700 years ago by Rabbi Mayer of Rottenburg, the preeminent halachic decisor of 13th century Germany, which helped to me to begin to clarify this issue. So Mayer of Rottenburg was asked the following question. A certain community, you know, Jews from all over Franco-Germany at that time, turned to Rabbi Mayer for halachic guidance on matters ritual, communal, they said, we want, to we want to appoint in our community a shliach tzibor, a cantor, but there's one problem. And if you look at the way that the original text of the responsa uh, is constructed, it says that God's judgment had struck out against that man. And if you look at the way that it's quoted in later sources, it seems that something had happened that his arms were paralyzed. His arms were paralyzed. Now, we don't know what happened to him. We don't know whether this was a birth defect. We don't know if this was an accident. Certainly, the language that God's judgment had reached out and struck him is certainly evocative of a time where Jews faced violence at every turn. But some community turns to the mayor of Rottenburg and says, can we appoint this man as our chazin, as our cantor? Now, I would think the immediate precedent that he would reach back to are the Kohanim of the Torah. And that he would tell them, I'm sure he's a great guy, but nothing doing. Instead, he writes that it is obvious to him that this individual is fitting to serve in this role. Not only that, he says that he is the ideal candidate. The king of kings delights in using shattered vessels. The king of kings delights in shattered vessels. And he adds almost parenthetically, and the rules of mumim, of physical defects, that's something for the Kohanim. Now, it seems to me this is a very beautiful, very sensitive kind of answer that Rabbi Mayer provides to this community. But of course, there's still an elephant in the room. If God desires shattered vessels, and we'll come back to that image in a little bit, so how do you explain the Torah's disqualification of all of those poor Kohanim? So one of the places we turn to to try to get better insight into the very nature of Jewish law is the famous compendium of Jewish law compiled by the Rambam, by Maimonides in the 12th century. And one of the many geniuses of the Rambam was his ability to construct categories that the categories themselves are instructive about the nature of the laws that he's discussing. So when the Rambam introduces us to the Kohanim, 
So the idea that there is this case, this family that is picked for a specific role to play in the temple, the Rambam puts it in a section called Clay Hamikdash Vahovdimbo. The vessels of the temple and those who work therein. And that's a very, very interesting classification. Because the Rambam essentially is telling us that the Kohanim are furniture. That when the Torah creates this concept of a sanctuary of a temple, it's got walls and roof and floor, it has implements, and it has human implements as well. But that the role of the Kohen, of the priest in the temple, is not, he's not there as an individual. He's there as part of the furniture to carry out a specific role that has nothing to do with himself, with his character, with his ego, that he's there literally to blend into the surroundings. And therefore, just like the Torah creates the temple as a zone of perfection, as an atmosphere where people can come and encounter God, that part of the creating of that atmosphere is the Kohanim have a certain physical standard which is demanded of them. Prayer is something else. Because what prayer means, and that's really what the Rabbi Mayor of Rottenberg was being asked about, prayer means actually encountering God. And when we're encountering, when we're building a relationship there, it's all really about the individual. It's about how God plays a role in my life, how God cares about me or about you. And once that's the playing field, then God loves shattered vessels. Because the temple is perfect. And as long as a coin is part of the temple, he has to be perfect also. But prayer is about brokenness. Prayer is about our admitting that there are things, whatever they are, physical, emotional, economic, spiritual, psychological, family, that we have things that are not perfect in our lives. And the direction to go to help to fill that gap is to go to God. So yeah, a Kohen who has a physical disfigurement doesn't make the cut. But a human being who's approaching God, all of us come with our brokenness. And the truth is, anytime we get together in shul to daven, it is a collective symphony of brokenness. Nobody knows what's in the broken heart of the person next to you. But that's what Rabbi Mayor of Rottenberg teaches us is what God desires. I want to share with you a very short, a hopefully short story that to me has helped me come to terms with this idea that the building blocks of our relationship to God is how we reach to him in our brokenness. So here's the story. 150 years ago, there was a budding Hasidic Rebbe. His name was Menachem Mendel of Vizhnetz. So Menachem Mendel of Vizhnetz, when he was a young man, just took on a spiritual practice that was not unheard of uh, throughout our history of going into exile, being able to try to, on a visceral level, identify with the pain of the Jewish people in exile, of God adrift in a world that doesn't recognize him. So he wandered from town to town, playing the part essentially of a, of a wandering vagabond, of a madman, to try to develop this spiritual skill. So he'd go from town to town, and basically people would shun him. They probably smelled bad, tattered clothing. No one would take him in. But there was one town. There was one town where there was one little girl, six, seven, eight-year-old girl named Rifkala. And whenever Mendel the beggar would come to town, Rifkala would invite him to her house. Now, Rifkala's parents were not interested in her bringing crazy people into the house. So she would set up in the yard, she had this rickety, broken down tea set. It was like a little table, uh, a kettle, little mugs. And she'd make a tea party for her and Mendela. And she would sneak, you know, some cookies out of the kitchen. And that was the only human contact that he had during those years. And she would prattle about whatever it is that they would chat about together. 
And they would sit, and they would talk, and they would laugh, and then eventually he would pick up his stick and his bag, he'd go off to the next town. After a number of years, he dropped this and went on to a storied career as the vision of Sarevim. Rivka grows up also, but her future, unfortunately, was not as glorious. Rivka developed some kind of a terrible disease and finds herself paralyzed. Perhaps it was polio. So as you can imagine, her parents are behind, beside themselves, trying to figure out what are we going to do for our daughter. So they take her, and I, I shudder to imagine what, you know, in 19th century Ukraine, right, what kind of doctors they found. Nothing works. So the girl keeps saying to her parents, Mommy, Daddy, I want you to take me to Vizhnitz. In Vizhnitz, there's a great righteous person, the Vizhnitz Sareva. That's my old friend Mendel, and he'll help us. And her parents are like, Mendel, that crazy person you used to, you know, talk to in the yard? But she kept pushing, and they said it couldn't hurt to go to the Rebbe. So the way I always picture this, it's like, it's like a cold Eastern European winter. And they load her up on the bed, because that was the only way they could move her. They put the bed on the cart, the cart goes out, and they travel to Vizhnitz. So in the base of Medrash, in the Rebbe's court, he's sitting there on his throne, and you know he's surrounded by his followers, lackeys, students, and suddenly, facing the river, the doors blow open. And there's, you know, wind and snow blowing in. And you see these parents schlepping their daughter on the bed into the base madrash. And as they walk in, there's like a moment of recognition. And the vision of the Rebbe looks out at her and says, Rifkala. And she says, Mendel. And all the Hasidim say, Mendel. And she says to Mendel, I'm so sick. So the Vizhnitz Rebbe calls over his gabai. Now, everybody knows that Hasidic Rebbe's had gabai. They had a combination, butlers, lackeys, servants. He calls the gabai, whispers in his ear. Now, if you're a gabai in one of these stories, you're used to doing strange things. So he has like a little bizarre look on his face, but he runs out, and everyone's just waiting to see what's going to happen. So he comes back. with a wooden crate, and he opens the crate, and in the crate, which he apparently just brought, found, dragged out from somewhere in the shtetl, he brings out a broken down tea table, and a cup, and a chipped teacup. And he pours tea into the kettle. And the vision of looks across the room and says, Rifkel, I want you to pour me a cup of tea like you used to. And at this point, the whole place is in tears. One minute goes by, two minutes, five minutes. Finally, Rivka, for the first time, maybe in years, slowly gets out of bed and goes over to the broken teacup to hand it to the vision of the Rebbe. God loves shattered vessels because it's those broken moments in our lives that we connect to him. And if we are able to establish those relationships of brokenness, it creates a relationship with God that will be with us and will strengthen us in anything that comes to us in life. Thank you.